when they turned this on, it's probably nice if my face comes on and says, you probably didn't expect me to appear here. But, but I wanted to say thank you for all the people who I've had the privilege to work with during my lifetime. I came into this world on a sunny, sunny Sunday afternoon at three in the afternoon in the place of my birth, Utrecht in the Netherlands. I don't remember any of that. My first uh, memory for my youth is that uh, the doctor came to give me my smallpox vaccination. All I remember is that I was scared to death. Uh, the doctor was very kind, very patient. Uh, I was not an easy patient for him, and, uh, but he accomplished the task. And uh, we saw him on a fairly regular basis because my parents uh, produced some siblings for me. First a sister, then a brother, then another sister, another brother. And my father was a good marksman. Soon thereafter, when I was about three years old, the Second World War broke out. And I don't remember very much, we were evacuated to Belgium because the Germans threatened to bomb the village where we were living. Holland surrendered and uh, I lived through the war years without too much trouble. We had, uh, a uh, German officer in the house who had requisitioned part of the house, together with his Batman. I just remember the smell of these people. German, uh, they were very particular about their boots and their, and their other leatherware, and it had a special odor about it. Mm -hmm. And that's still in my memory. And uh, we also had three, what we called underduik underduikers, three people, one woman and two young men, who the Germans would like to put in the gas chambers, and uh, we didn't think that was such a good idea. Um, anyway, they stayed with us throughout the end of the war. The liberation itself, I'll never forget. And it also made very sure, in my mind, that I did not want to participate in any, in any warfare of, of that kind. Um, we had heard the battle for Holland coming closer and closer, rumbling in the f in far distance. The next day it was closer and closer, and we were having dinner in the dining room. My mother had, I forget what she, what she had, but it was a chip. Spent a fair bit of time making a decent meal, but it was not easy in, in the war years when everything was on a ration. And, uh, and then there was this funny sound. Uh, a whistle, whistling sound, followed by a loud bang. And my father said, we are going to the, to the cellar right now. Barely were we down, or a grenade exploded right in the middle of our dining room. The, the violence, the shaking, the noise, uh, three days it took, um, I'll never forget. Thereafter, um, school started a little bit. Uh, many of the schools were unusable, so I entered grade one in a cow barn where during the night the cows were, and after they were, had been milked, um, we were sitting in the in the barn on proper uh, desks that somebody had rescued, uh, two rows, and uh, that's where I learned my, my first step so towards medical school. And we had a teacher that was out of this world. If they could clone that man, the world would look very different than they do now. I uh, grew up in a family of where there were many physicians and professionals and dentists and uh, other people who had interesting conversations. And they, my parents received a lot of people at dinners. Uh, they were quite sociable. And they insisted that we took part in that. Just be fairly quiet and listen. And if there was something that people asked, did you give a good answer and, and so on. And that was very useful uh, to have that kind of environment to grow up in. My mother had a, had a dog and my father had a dog. My father had a Great Dane. And there is a uh, uh, old 
eight millimeter movie that's now on, on CD, where you see me uh, playing with a dog, Great Dane. And so you get an imprint in your brains that big dogs are okay. You don't need to worry about it. I was the oldest one. And then I had a sister, Monique. She came three years after I was born. Uh, she became a social worker, politician, um, uh, very prominent in Holland, as the leader of the opposition. Then came my brother, uh, who I didn't get along with very well <laughs> initially. Now we're the best of friends. We talk with each other at least once a week on Skype. Then came another sister, a strange bird, <laughs> uh, who... Uh, got married uh, with an anthropologist that went to Papua New Guinea. She divorced him there, fell in love with, a, with one of the natives there. Well, I'm going to write a story about her. So I finished high school um, quite well. I wrote the state exam, which gave me access to any of the universities in Holland for any profession you wanted to pick. To pick. So it was time to come to, to the university. I decided I wanted to become a physician. And now, well, some 50 years later, I must say that was a wise and good decision. I uh, apparently was cut out to be in the helping professions and do it with, with conviction and with dedication. It was hard work. The yeah. Uh, a lot of people failed the first exam because they came from high school and they had not learned how to apply themselves. I had uh, a sword hanging over my head that if I failed, I would be cut off. So I wasn't going to fail. He said, when my father said something, that he meant it. There was no issue with the about it. And he knew, knew I was capable. He also wanted me to balance my life between studying and physical activity. And I liked rowing. I spent a lot of time on the water in Holland, which is not a difficult thing to do. So I was selected to join the Varsity 8 for the, And we were very successful. We won the Varsity for the, for the 8s in, uh, in Holland and then went on international rowing. I was fitter than fit. It was unbelievable. Uh, in, in Holland, when you're in medical school, you... Uh, are drafted into the army for officers, officers training, and you do that during your holidays. And there was four of us from the Varsity 8 that ended up in the same boot camp. And that really helped to also to absorb the material that you had to absorb sit, sitting. And many people think that if you just sit behind a book all day, all, in the evening and so on, that you can absorb all that. That's wrong. The Chinese figured it out a long time ago, yin and yang, you have to be physically Lots of input, and mentally a lot of input. And if you keep that reasonable balance, you're much more effective and efficient. After I got my bachelor's, I took a little break, four months. I had applied for a job in the States as a waterfront director. And uh, I got the job. Return ticket, $60, first class, by boat. The job lasted two, two months, and then I, the rest of the time was reserved for my... I made some friends, and with the three of us, we bought a car and traveled. And the space, and the friendliness, and the safety, and the different way of thinking uh, in the North American continent, it was a fresh uh, wind blowing through my, through my brains. The day after I got my Dutch license, my wife and I left for, for New York, flew over to, uh, to Seattle, and... Uh, Started my job on January the 1st in 63. And the first two years I was in, uh, in Seattle, downtown Seattle. And then I had a falling out with the fellow who I was working with. And I went to Issaquah, which was looking for a doctor. So that was a good move. Other than I didn't know there were a John Birch Society a community. Red, rednecks from here to eternity. When they turned around, the, the room lit up in, in red, red light. The Vietnam was heating up. And then one of my colleagues wrote an opinion piece and saying what a great job the American army was doing in, the, in, the, in Vietnam and how they were winning the hearts and minds of people. And, and I wrote back uh, saying, all this is drivel. You're going to lose this and you're going to get kicked out mercilessly. A week later, 
I was reclassified to be immediately available for the draft. I said, no way. So I contacted a lawyer, and I read the Selective Service Act, and I was really not eligible for draft. So then I, they had gathered together a special appeal board, and they said, no, you are eligible, and you're going you're gonna to go. And so when I said, well, I'm a physician. I don't discriminate, but these people that you're wounding will get priority, and if there's time left and energy left, I'll look after your, your soldiers. They didn't like to hear that. So I said, well, this is probably a lost cause, and I want to go to, to Canada. I did the paperwork, closed my office on Friday evening. At four in the morning, my old son and I stepped in the car, drove to the border, and came here. I found this country so incredibly welcoming and nice to live in. It didn't give me any trouble to say goodbye. I did some uh, research first, if this was a good place. I looked at Abbotsford, looked at Duncan, I looked at a bunch of places where they were looking for physicians. So I hooked up with Dr. Arbor, who had worn out 25 assistants in as many years, tough and abrupt, uh, but very knowledgeable and uh, was a good clinician. Four years into the practice, he said, we'll have elections for um, chief of staff, for the medical staff. And that was the start of my career in administrative medicine. So um, I became involved in the hospital, first the hospital administration, and then I got asked to join the board of fa family physicians in, in British Columbia. Within a few years I was sitting in the chair, and they didn't want to leave, me to leave, so I did two, two terms. Uh, and it was fun. And so you learn a lot of things, how to do things, how the system works behind the scenes. And so one of my colleagues then nominated me to come on the provincial board for family physicians. So after I had served two terms, they called and said, we would like to nominate you to come on the national executive. So I said yes. And then in 92, I was the 39th president. He cornered me at the hospital and he said, can you help me? Is that, have you heard of St. John Ambulance? And he said, I want to start a branch here in, in Maple Ridge. A few years later, I was chair. And then the provincial organization was in deep financial trouble. They asked me to serve on that board. And then they asked me to become the council president. So the inevitable happened. Now you're on the national. Yeah, not because I want to, but because other people want, want me to. And that vote of confidence builds confidence. And that was noticed in, in Ottawa, and then I got a letter from the Governor-General that the Queen has endorsed you uh, to be knighted. That uh, came as a bit of a shock, because you have no say in that. My father was a Rotarian, past president in Holland, so I was exposed to Rotary quite a bit. I was installed as a fellow Rotarian with the old Haney Club. I ran out of spare time, my practice was getting bigger and bigger, and deliveries and so on. And so after a few years, I resigned. Then one of their members came to me and said, we should start a luncheon club here in Maple Ridge. Would you be interested? I said, yes, I would be. And so I'm a charter member of the current Rotary Club. It's been a great addition to, to my personal growth and uh, involvement in the community. All of us have promised to live by the four-way test. When you become a Rotarian, you're expected with every action that you take, that you ask yourself, is it true? Is it fair to the other party and ourselves? Is it a win-win situation? Will it build better friendship? And is it beneficial to, to all? Learned how to build forms, pour concrete, framing, you name it. And then we had nearly three feet of snow. And the thing didn't collapse, so I must be doing something right. And then I yeah, started thinking about uh, building a house from scratch. And then when I came home, I would frame a wall at lunch and then come home out after work. I would raise the, the wall and then another one, another one, another one. <laughs> it, it took three years because I wanted to do it thoroughly. And I said, we won't move in until the kitchen and the bathrooms are completed. Now, if I look at this, I, I, did I really do all this? Yes, I did. And then... My wife worked in the hospital. We'd known each other for a long time. And, um, I yeah, learned that she had divorced. And she, I thought she was an awfully competent, warm nurse. The kind of nurse that I have a vision that, that all nurses should be that way. So I asked her out for lunch. 
and her qualities were such that I said, I'll, I'll take it on. And now, 30 years later, no regrets, none. The people I met, the friends I made, I'm probably one of the luckiest men in the world. Are there any negatives to the course of my life? Of course there is. I've been extremely lucky. Uh, La La Jane has been a tower of strength through all the misery I've put her through with my current disease. This was not asked for and um, she never wavered. She never uh, said, I can't do this. They recognize you for things you just did them because you wanted to do them, not because people wanted to reward you. But towards the end of my life, a lot of people came out of the woodwork, they nominated me for stuff, and now I, I look like a Christmas tree if I uh, put all that stuff on. Uh, it's very nice, but it was even nicer to, to do the job rather than to receive it. And the, uh, uh, the recognition is, uh, is important for a lot of people. Initially, in my earlier in my career, yes. Now, uh, having been there, done all that, um, I wish the people who come after me that they have as much enjoyment in earning their kudos as I did. Dear family and friends, this is the end of uh, my goodbye to you. I hope you have enjoyed it. It will give you a little bit of insight why I turned out the kind of person I did. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to say I made a whole lot more friends than I have developed enemies. And even those, many of them have, after we both sides tried, have become friends. And let's hope that the world will continue to evolve that way.